Halo, halo, halo.
hello sir you are you are you muted sir you are on mute please unmute it hello uh, ajni Um no that's actually one of my teammate um his name is Naresh she is actually um you know uh, a part of uh, a technical team is going to take care of the live and how is it going to happen yeah no i actually cannot i mean um i actually cannot. i think um, uh, you have your video off i think so Uh, oh okay um just a second yeah, yeah just a second yeah actually i just uh, i'm also able to only see the photograph i'm not able to see you um um could, could you just um uh, leave the meeting and um uh, you know uh, come back again because i'm not able to see you just uh, maybe my team maybe my team may be able to see you let me just ask him naresh are you able to see Yeah, I can see, but uh, no audio. Audio is not coming. Actually, he's saying your audio is not coming. Um, so could you just you know leave the meeting and come back again? Okay. All right. That'll be great. You know. Oh yeah. On on the left side, top top left. Yeah. Join audio also. Tell join audio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can put on the password and and the ID. Mm Yeah. Listen to click on that. Yeah. Okay. I saw, you know, iPhone join. It was written iPhone join, but I'm not able to see you. Oh, I now. Yeah, now I can see you. so you are wearing this white t-shirt okay now i can see okay great um naresh are you able to i are you able to hear him now listen to him naresh are you there i think you are on mute actually can you unmute that yeah okay yeah just a second yeah i think um naresh are you there Yeah, Naresh. Yeah, Naresh, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, yes, Rajin, please. Okay, yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, so can you see the guest? Yeah, I can see, but uh, you need to join the audio, sir. Join audio will be there. I think he has unmute. Um. No, no, no. He is on mute. On unmute only. 
so uh, there will be option like uh, if you tap the screen you will be option like uh, join audio click on the oh. join audio okay uh, so i think okay uh, i think if you uh, you know if you tap it onto your onto your screen then uh, there will be this option um, join the audio i think and then you have to join with the audio too already joined it seems so maybe but when okay um uh, can, can you use hands free so that we could you know i think we can Hmm. Yeah. I think. Uh, that game. Yeah. Uh, I think my team is not able to hear you. Can you um use hands free if you have you do you have earphones if you can use that. Yeah. Actually, you know because you my me uh, I and my team is not able to hear. Can you, you hear, Rajni? You can you hear? You can hear. Uh, actually, I'm on uh, I'm on phone. I'm on. phone with oh, him oh you are explaining on phone okay sir can you hear the audio sir uh, of the guest yeah he can no no i am asking sir yes sir yeah, yeah, i i can hear i can i can hear it i can hear you i can hear rajni yeah sir there is a audio issue with the guest sir so, okay uh, okay um, you know we are having some audio issue with you because we have two guests um, two of our team yeah we are able to hear them but no, no, go ahead oh yeah yeah uh, uh. so as he he is there but i think he's just doing something yeah who rajni i'm here i'm available yeah I'm, okay he I'm he just point. said hi to you okay Okay. Yeah. So, Rajni, okay. you can uh, you can tell to come on mobile or any gadget, any other mobile. Okay. Um. Do you have any other gadget? I mean, if you can use some other phone or a laptop or something. Rajni, uh, is it the same mobile you are speaking, and the same mobile is on Zoom? Ah, uh, you are talking about me? No, no, no. We are about guest. He is speaking in the same mobile. Um, I don't know. Uh, are you using the same phone? I mean, for for the Zoom okay. as well as for you know we. Hello. If if it is the same mobile, the audio won't come. Ah, uh, okay. Just a second. I think um, you know, we are actually on a call. Ah, uh, so are you using the same for a phone for Zoom too? Oh, okay. Maybe that's the issue then. Ah, uh, I'll just cut the call. Okay, I'm just going to hang up. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay.
Ya, halo. Halo. Ya. Iya. Yeah. Uh, got it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Naresh finally solved the problem. Uh, yeah, now we can hear you. Uh, I think he left. Let's join again. Yeah. Okay. That was the problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you on mute, yeah. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay. Uh, that was the problem. Hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. okay uh, do you need to get ready? You said you, you will be yes, getting I, ready for the... <laughs> I have my, my shirt and tie in the other room. Oh, okay. So I can I can go ahead and, and leave the meeting right now. You said it starts at 9.30, correct? Yes, we have 17 minutes. Go ahead, sir, please. Okay, right. So I was going to call at around 10 or 5 or 10 minutes beforehand. And then get started. Do, be I, yeah. do you want to start? Five minutes should be good enough. Yeah, five minutes. Okay. Thank you. All right. See. I'll I'll uh, be be ready then. Thank you. All right. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, okay. And until then, can we also yeah. leave? You know, Rajni, yeah, we can leave. I mean, Rajni, I mean, we have a call tomorrow with the Ayurveda doctor, right? Yeah, you, you, you know you're hosting it, which is very nice. Please go ahead and host it. I may join for five to six minutes. Let me see if I can. I mean, I will. Uh, I will just few questions. Others, I can send you those questions. I mean, uh, you can ask him those questions too. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, you can also join. Um, you you know you can also join in between. That sure, is sure. also I'll join for few minutes and then we are. If, we you, have, have if you have time. Sure. What, okay, what time I mean, is if that? If you have time, so, uh, no, no, it's from nine to ten. Evening. Nine to ten. No issues. I I will be able. I, I don't think we have any other shows tomorrow. Line. The only one show is there. That that is the evening tomorrow for me. So we are okay. I will join for two yeah. minutes. Not a problem. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good day. Okay. Thanks. I will join in few minutes then. Okay. All right. Um. Also, this thing. Um. Can we? Yeah. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're saying uh, something. Also, no. Yeah, also we have this thing, you know, I think um, we have some problem coordinating with Maria. She, I, I don't know, I think she's not able to, um, uh, whether she's sending or the Skype link to the guest or not. And uh, Because, you know, the, we, I, I let, actually let, let, let us talk follow up. up yeah, yeah, suddenly we'll let us talk up yeah. after this interview, we'll talk about it. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 Buddy. Okay, that is I'm leaving the meeting for now, okay? Yeah, yeah, you can join before 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, we need to set the, we need to tell to the guest about the horizontal and we need to fix yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I need to tell that's it. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, I can mute it then. I think there is an issue with your net or your audio, I don't know, but there is some disturbance while you're talking. Okay. Oh, okay. You know, I'm not using earplugs. Let me use this. Actually, maybe then it will be a problem. Just a second. Yeah, now, hello? Is it okay now? now? Yeah, it's perfect now. Yeah, because you know, I wasn't using earphones. Okay, now it seems fine. Okay, I'm unmuting my, I'm sorry, I'm muting my meeting. Talk.
Yeah. Hello, sir. Sir, can you please rotate your mobile? Okay. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. Very good. Can you please keep your mobile in horizontal? Sir? Yeah, on the on the portrait mode, sir. Portrait mode, I think. Auto rotate. Ah, uh, you need to put it on horizontal mode. <clears throat> hello. Yes. Hello. Uh yeah, hi. Uh, you know, you need to uh, turn on your auto rotation mode on your phone. Yeah, I need to turn uh, on my what? Auto rotation mode. You have an auto rotation mode on your phone. You need to turn on that. Okay. All right. Authorization mode. All auto right. rotation. It's auto no, no, rotation auto mode. Rotation. Rotation. I mean, the screen rotation. Oh. Rotation, yeah. okay, oh, it's yeah. rotate. All right, let's see here. All right, rotation. <laughs> rotation. Rajni, you know how to guide him step by step. Okay. iPhone, I, I think, think iPhone. Sir. Yeah, he's uh, using iPhone. Okay, you mean this? No, no, you actually have turned your back camera. Um, you know, you uh, on the right side, on the top of the right side, if you drag it down, you'll have this um, internet sign, Wi-Fi sign, Bluetooth sign. Yes. Um, so so there you have, yeah. So there you have this auto rotation, um, you know, a lock and key sign, a, a key sign. Can you see that? Under your Wi-Fi sign, there is this auto rotation sign. Can you see that? Uh, uh, let's see. I'm trying. I'm trying. Um, uh, I have I have chat. I have meeting settings, virtual background, raise hand, disconnect audio. I have clapping. I have um, I have um, thumbs up. I have leave, I have live, I have Zoom. I have. Uh, um, it's not in the Zoom, sir. Not in the Zoom. No, in your no, mobile. it's not there. In your phone, actually, where you have, you know, your battery sign. Can you see oh, your yes, battery yes, sign? Yes. If yes. you drag it down, yeah, yeah. So if you drag that down, yeah. So you have, you know, um, your internet sign, your Bluetooth yes. sign, your Wi Fi sign. Can you see? Yes. So there you have this auto rotation mode. Under okay. Wi-Fi, you okay. just need to yeah you you need to click on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Actually, your video is not available. We can't see you. Oh, you can't see me. Mm -hmm. Because you oh. might be using. Yeah. Oh yeah. You just okay. need to click on that auto rotation, and then you can come on your turn on the video. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, oh dear, you, uh, you saw me before, correct? No, no, we can, no, I, we can see you now. Uh, can you just uh, rotate your phone? Can you uh, rotate rotate your phone? Like this? No, 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 not like that. Rot um, at rotation as right? Yeah, the horizontal. Yeah. Can you put your phone on a horizontal oh, oh. mode? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. Hold on. You'll be done a table. That should be good enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, hold on. Yeah. Um, unmuted. Okay. Done speaking. Um, yes. One moment. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you see me? 
Um, no, actually. Okay, you're right. I I can't see you either. Yeah, yeah, I think you are. Okay, why don't you restart the Zoom from your phone? Yeah, now, now we can. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, okay. now it seems fine. Okay. Now you can place your phone on a table or somewhere where it doesn't okay. shake. Okay, I understand. All right, mm -hmm. and so you want it horizontal like this? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's... Let's try and get this to where you want it like this. Um, I had it. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah. All right. And light. Yeah. Okay. I don't think you want it to. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, of course, I can't see you. Uh, can you see me or not? I can see you now. I can yeah, see yeah. You I mean, now. We, we both will be talking to each other. They won't be coming on the screen. Okay. Okay. So let's see here if we can get this in a position to where I don't look like I'm tilted up. All right. We're almost there. So no particular let's bear, bear with us here. As you say. Maneuver this one last time here. something like right here. So let me see here. All right, one moment here. Let's just do it. Let's just do this. the trick here. height is there.
Well, um, if you don't mind this angle, I suppose this angle. I, um, I think this seems fine. Naresh? It's fine, fine. Sam. Is good, it good fine? It's yeah, the angle seems fine. All right. All right. <laughs> Finally. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's just go ahead and use this angle. And I can't see you anymore, but I can. Uh, uh, are you able to see me or no? I, I, can, I can see you now. I can see you okay. now. Okay. I'm in Venice already. Uh, your video is gone, right? Okay. And we are back. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, you can yes, um, nice, nice, nice. start yeah. that. You can. You can leave. So I, I okay, will also I'm leave after. Yeah. Done. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That is. Let me know when to start. We'll start. At the yes, sir. I'm ready, sir. Uh, start of the thirty seconds. Start. I'm ready. Start. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and whatever time you see this video. Today we have a special guest uh, from 26th Congressional District in uh, California. I mean, he ran for the position. I mean, uh, so we want to share some, get some views from him. Mr. David Lozano, uh, welcome to the show. Mr. David Lozano from the uh, South of Valley. How are you today? Very good, thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming to the show. So we would like to know a little more about yourself, your background, like I mean, your career, and uh, and what were you doing in the before getting into the politics, and then what made you to run for elections uh, in the congressional district? Can you share your uh, details? Please? Well, I, I actually got my start as a police officer. I was a Los Angeles County Sheriff, mm -hmm. and uh, back in the late '70s, early '80s. And I actually worked in Watts. I worked in South Central Los Angeles uh, in a very um, uh, unique area of Los Angeles. It was uh, called uh, Lenox Firestone Linwood. This was the South Central area. It was a, a very uh, uh, crime-ridden, uh, uh, rather dangerous area of Los Angeles back in, that, in those days. Uh, I've made over a hundred felony arrests. I was an involved in quite a few uh, uh, crime investigation teams. I worked, uh, the unique thing about uh, working as a sheriff uh, versus a police officer is that as a sheriff in California, you have to first work your first year uh, in the jail system. So when you, when you graduate from the police academy, from the sheriff academy, you have to first work your first year in the jails. And that's a unique experience because you actually get the chance to actually work hand in hand with the criminals. And you actually get a chance to really understand their mentality and how they speak and how they talk. And you relate to the criminals firsthand. You learn how to work with them. And then you go out into the street. So you don't come right from the academy right out onto the street. You go and you spend a year. Now I spent two years in the jail system and I worked a variety of different jails. I didn't just work the main central jail. I worked a variety of different types of jails that the uh, Los Angeles jail system has. And um, I worked the women's jail. I worked the, um, the hospital jail. I worked the intake jail. It was a really incredible experience. Uh, then I worked uh, out in the streets. And with that jail experience and the variety of jail experience, obviously it gave me a great insight in how to handle the streets. And it was a, it was a phenomenal experience. But um, after working that for over six years, uh, um, something came over me. I was uh, 
I was uh, kind of interested in wanting to do more. And so I found myself um, wanting to get involved in politics, but I actually um, realized that I needed to go beyond what uh, was really being offered kind of uh, in this country. I, I had a degree, a bachelor's degree in political science, but I wanted to see what the world had out there. So I actually got the idea to actually work and travel around the world. And so what I did was I actually worked uh, for Club Med for, a, for an international resort uh, organization that had resorts all over the world. And I worked as a scuba diving instructor. So because I had a license to teach scuba diving here in California, I expanded that license to teach all over the world. Then I got a job uh, at Club Med, but the purpose of the job was to meet guests from all over the world because there was about 700 guests that would arrive at the club each week. And I would teach different guests how to dive and I would take them on dive excursions. But by the end of the week, I had made friends with them and they were from all over the world, Germany, France, Italy, India, everywhere. And so they would always invite me to come. They would give me their address. And they would say, look, if you ever get to Germany, if you ever get to, to uh, France, please you know, come and see us and, and visit with us and, and the whole bit, we'd love to take you around. By the time I finished one year working for the club, uh, in two different locations. I worked in, in um, Martinique Island in the Caribbean and I worked in Cancun uh, for six months and Martinique for six months. I had gathered over 700 addresses from people all over the world. And then I purchased an around the world airline ticket for $2,500. And those tickets are very special. You can get on and off the plane as many times as you want, whenever you want, as long as you travel in one direction around the world, either east or west, you have to travel around the world. I traveled westerly around the world and you just zigzag up and down the globe and you can get on and off the plane as many times as you want. And you just travel around the world for one year. But everywhere I went around the world, I always had an address of, of someone to stay with. And they would pick me up at the airport. I would stay at their house. And if I ever had a place that was pretty um, wild or, or there wasn't anyone there, there was always an international club or hotel to work at. So I would just knock on the door of some hotel and I would, uh, or some resort or, or another club med. And I would say, look, I'm an international dive instructor. Or I would have, I, I worked as one hotel as a tennis instructor. Or, or some kind of guest relations person. And because of my police background, because of my maturity, I was 28 years old. Everyone around the world was so friendly and they were so welcomely, uh, uh, of welcoming me of, of, of everywhere I went in my background. It was never a problem. And my, 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 um, as an American, we have this great hesitation about, um, other people from around the world being a, a little bit, um, we seem to be so cautious of everyone else around the world, uh, a little bit hesitant uh, that we have a, a certain vision of people. It's just the opposite. Everyone around the world is so friendly. Uh, other cultures and other, other relations, they were, everywhere I traveled around the world, everyone opened their door everyone was incredibly friendly, all cultures, whether it was China or, or, or uh, uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, uh, Egypt, um, it, it was just incredible. I was in uh, Fiji of all places and uh, I got off the plane uh, uh, for $7. I took a, a local bus to get me all across the other side of the main island to uh, Sabu Sabu to, uh, and it was, a, it was a bus that was gonna take me along the coastline. Uh, the interior was all jungle, but the coastline was obviously right next to the ocean. 
And for $7, it would take me across all the way across the island. I think it took 17 hours to get across to the, uh, to the East Coast. And, uh, but I had to jump on the little bus with uh, all the locals and with little pigs and chickens and, and uh, lambs and sheep and everything else and open windows. And there I was traveling along the coast. And um, uh, it was about, I don't know, I was probably six, seven hours into the trip. It was pretty exhausting. It was pretty hot. Uh, it was a tropical island, of course. And it was getting pretty boring. And all of a sudden, I saw a shack along the ocean there, along the coast, with an international scuba diving insignia on the roof. So I thought, oh my gosh, there's a scuba diving shop there. I can get a job there. So I, I yelled out to the bus driver to stop. And so he stopped and I jumped off and I ran back to the shop, but it was closed. And it was around 4.35 o'clock. And I didn't realize any of this at the time. I was just uh, focused on trying to jump off and, and uh, get to the shop, but I didn't realize it was Friday. And I was standing there kind of like on the road, not realizing you know, that it was pretty abandoned. There was nobody around, there's no cars, there's no houses, it's just the jungle on the other side of the road and the ocean, and there's no one around. And I'm standing there realizing, oh my gosh, what did I just do? I, 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 there's no one around. And all of a sudden a voice calls out and says, are you okay? And I turn around and it's just, a very elderly Fijian man, and, and I don't know if you know Fijians, but they're very large people. They're very, Fijian people are very big, very large. And it was, he was about a 65, 70 year old man, very nice. But he, I said, well, yes, I said, I accidentally got off the bus. Uh, and I said, you know, I'll just wait for the next bus. And he goes, well, there's no other buses today. He goes, it's Friday, there won't be another bus until Monday. And he said, well, is there a hotel? Is there anything close by? And he said, no, there's, that's 60 miles away. And I said, oh my gosh. And I, he said, well, if you don't mind Fijian food, he says, you're welcome to come home with me. And just like that, he welcomes me home to his home. And so I said, certainly. And so uh, I said, thank you very much. And he, he, right, I didn't even see a car, but he had a car parked behind a, a, a tree. And so we get into his car. We, we, we turn down the road, he turns right into the jungle. We, we drive into the jungle and we're driving in the jungle for about, oh gosh, 15, 20 minutes and the trees are flapping on the windshield. And, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, you know, this is pretty uh, interesting. I'll say that word. Uh, and I was getting a little nervous and uh, thinking, oh my gosh, I have no idea where I'm going and what's going on here. And, and all of a sudden the car stops uh, against this giant hill, this grassy hill. And I'm thinking, I don't see anything, just this giant grassy hill in the middle of the jungle. And, and he gets out of the car, so I get out and I look up to the way top of the hill and this giant Fijian man, I just see his figure comes to the edge of the hill and the older Fijian man looks up and calls out, he yells out, gives out this Fijian yell and and the man yells back blah, 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 and thinking what's going on and then all of a sudden all these pygmies come to each side of the man on the top of the hill and I'm thinking oh my gosh and then I suddenly realize wait a minute the the history of Fijians is is that they're 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 cannibals they they, they eat people and I'm thinking oh my gosh what did he just do and then all of a sudden the pygmies come running down the hill and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get eaten. And I'm about ready to turn and run. And it turns out that these aren't pygmies, they're children. And they run around the old Fijian man and they're hugging him and they're greeting him back. And the, and the tall big man is his son-in-law and he runs down, he picks up my backpack. He races back up top of the hill. We walk up the top of the hill this elderly man is the king of his village. The village is on the other side. He's, he's got a house, a, a beautiful little hut up there. He's the pastor of his church. The village is down in the valley below. I end up staying with him for three days. I, I, I end up feeding all the pigs, meeting all the villagers. 
Turns out I'm there the third night and he brings me a big giant old photograph album and he puts it on my lap and he says, open it up. And I open up the photograph album and there's all these black and white old 1960, 1950, 30 photographs. And I could see in the book that there's pictures of him as a young man and the Fijians, they wear skirts as, as their traditional outfit. And one picture after the other, I can see him there getting a little older and it's nice and the whole bit. And all of a sudden I look at the picture and he's there and he's standing next to Eisenhower, Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Nixon, He's the ambassador of Fiji to the United Nations. That's who he is. Wow. And he's retired. Hmm. And that's who he is. And, and, and that, I couldn't believe it. And that's how my world travels went as I traveled around the world for three years. Everywhere I went, that's my experience. It's, by the way, I was so touched by this experience. When I got married, my wife and I went to Fiji on our honeymoon and stayed with this Fijian family. Oh, very nice. Very on strange. our honeymoon. Yeah. So it, it just, that's what it's like to, if Amer more Americans could get out and experience the world and experience what it's like to really understand different cultures, this is what, this is why I think we have such a misunderstanding and it's why there's such, I don't, I don't want to say prejudice or, or bias or anything, but there's just a misunderstanding of what's out there. Very nice. Very, very impressive uh, uh, journey you had. I mean, probably with you, we can do multiple uh, different uh, series of uh, uh, shows that come from the, the travel around the world. And uh, one of them can be the different cultures and another purely with the police uh, the department. I mean, you, you have so much of... Uh, things to get from information on i mean from you uh, so much it's very impressive the nice to hear your story so let's uh, get back to one point i mean what made you to run for the uh, office get the uh, well i've been my degree is in political science but when i came back from uh, my world travels i was going to go into the secret service and so one of my best friends was working for the cia and uh, I, I, uh, I wanted to work for the Secret Service, so I was waiting uh, to, for my application to be finished processing. And uh, he was the one who said, look, he said, David, he says, sometimes it takes the government a long time to process your application. You better have a backup plan. So he says, you know, why don't you become a lawyer? Why don't you apply for law school? and uh, see where that takes you. I said, oh, I, I don't want to do that. I said, you know, that, <laughs> that'll take years. And they like, no, no, you better have a backup plan. Well, sure enough, I wasn't hearing from, from the Secret Service. So I went ahead and applied and I got accepted to law school in Connecticut. And so I found myself going to law school and uh, I, I became the vice president of the law school as a student. I got selected to work up at the state capitol in Connecticut. I ended up working uh, for summers and my summer internships down in Washington, D.C. for an uh, African-American criminal defense attorney, uh, Bill Moffat. He, uh, he was just incredible, uh, just, a, a, just an incredible, incredible attorney, taught me all types of things. His, um, his associate attorney uh, was a... Uh, a woman who now is a federal judge in uh, in Virginia, and um, and so the entire time I've always been interested in politics, but working up at the state capitol in Connecticut, I actually did experience um, a lot of these politicians truly not caring necessarily for the public, but. I really did see firsthand how their focus and attention and emphasis was on getting reelected, raising campaign money. It really wasn't about focusing on the issues. And I was really disheartened by experiencing that. 
And, and I thought, if this is really politics, I really don't want to be a part of that. And so I found myself enjoying the law. And so I, I graduated and just became a lawyer and focused on that. And I've been doing my area of law, uh, finance and, and uh, bankruptcy and, and everything um, uh, in, in dealing with, with uh, economics and such that, that I've enjoyed that for 28 years now. However, uh, obviously, you cannot ignore what's occurring in society. The big issues for me are homelessness. Uh, obviously, police reform has always been a huge issue for me, way before what's been occurring now in the United States. And the difference between myself and all other candidates, all other politicians is, I actually have solutions. I don't wish to address the issue. I'm here to solve the problem. I have solutions. For instance, my number one issue is homelessness. California has some fabulous organizations that are all trying, fabulous cities and organizations that are trying to address the issue. They've, they've built homes, they've built buildings and, and units, um, housing units to feed and educate the homeless. They're doing things to really try to help the issue, but the issue is so big, it's so massive that their small contribution, even though it's wonderful, it's truly wonderful. The problem is that we as a nation need to come together and address the greater issue of homelessness together. Because even though one particular city might be able to solve a small portion of the issue, the moment they help 20 homeless people or 50 homeless people, here comes a hundred more. And that's not solving the problem. I'm here to solve the national problem, the entire problem. That's what I'm here to do. The issue right now with police reform, there are some wonderful um, solutions or suggestions to police reform. There are politicians out there, there are citizens out there who are saying, well, let's remove um, uh, chokeholds. Let's bring in uh, a response team who specializes in mental health so that when there's a, a, uh, an emergency call and the person is mentally ill, let's get a response team to assist for that people. These are great ideas, great ideas. But together, once again, we need a uniformed uh, 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 entire process that the nation can use together for the entire police unit, the law enforcement ent entirety for everyone to follow. And at the start of this is one important thing. And that is, I, I've been a police officer before. Now listen carefully, this is important. Yes, I'm a police, I was a police officer, but what this nation needs are peace officers. Peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace officers. What the nation needs are simply officers to keep your community at peace, Ju just a gentle peace. We've been watching police television shows and movies, and, and it's all about shooting and arresting people and everything. You, it doesn't need to be that way. It, it, we can always go and arrest someone later. We don't have to arrest them on the scene. We don't have to jump on top of them, twist their arms behind their back and shove uh, handcuffs on people 
and shove them into cars. That, it doesn't have to be that way. You can literally go to a scene, keep the peace quietly, calmly. If someone has to be arrested, we can just simply tell them, you need to come to the station and we're gonna bring your lawyer with you and we can arrest you later. I mean, there's so many things that can be done. This is a much longer conversation, but, but there's a whole spectrum of things that can be done and this thing about the mentally ill, that's my third um, other issue that we must address. My, my wife and I, uh, we have a mentally ill son with severe OCD, ADHD, and Tourette syndrome. And uh, this was discovered when he was 14 years old. Prior to that, our son was perfectly fine. He was a top student, uh, top sportsman. He played three musical instruments. He was uh, gonna make some television commercials. He was great. He had, he had dozens and dozens of friends. He played Little League. Uh, he was a Boy Scout. Everything was fantastic. And then we got a call from school and we said, please, Mr. and Mrs. Lozano, get up here right away. There's something wrong with your son. And for the next uh, six months, we went to a dozen doctors. Nobody knew what was wrong with him. And finally, one doctor said, I'm sorry, but your son has severe OCD. We said, what's that? We didn't even know what it was. And finally, we had to take him to Massachusetts where he had to spend six months in a, a, a medical facility um, where he was, he, it was a lockdown medical facility for teenagers with OCD. Um, and, and, um, and, We've been battling this mental illness now for the last six years, and there is no cure. It's a lifetime illness that he has to learn to address and deal with. So my wife and I have gone all over the country to different conventions, different uh, meetings. We're on the internet talking to other parents all over the country dealing with mental illness. I never experienced any mental illness issues before in my life, ever. And now having looked back as a police officer, I now realize that I, I knew nothing when I was approaching all of these suspects, how, how me, so many of them were probably mentally ill and I was not properly approaching them. So uh, I know that none of these officers are properly trained. I wasn't. And so there's no, you don't get trained like that in the academy. Gotcha. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to hear about the incident with your son. Hopefully things will change uh, in a better way for you and your family. Uh, so, I mean, can you, I mean, when, when we are on the topic of the police and right now the issue of uh, defunding and uh, repealing the qualified immunity, before we go there, I mean, can you help us out in understanding our audience? What is the difference between a sheriff and a police officer? What What is the difference? We see cars, even now, I, I don't know the difference between uh, these two departments or these two officers. Sure. Uh, sure. Yeah, a, a lot of people, unless you're like in the state of California, there is there is a uniqueness uh, about the difference between them. So let me teach you. Uh, sure. A police officer is usually in a blue uniform. That's normally one difference. Police are in blue uniforms. Sheriffs are usually in a beige khaki or khaki green or green uniform. Now that's a very small difference, but it's just something very unique. So sheriffs are usually khaki, police are blue. Police officers, uh, represent a city. So when you are a police officer, you are a city police officer. You're paid for by the individual city. So the city of Los Angeles, the city of Pasadena, the city of, of, uh, of uh, San Marino, the city of Alhambra, these are individual cities that have decided to pay for their own individual police department, okay? So that's a police department. A sheriff 
is paid for by a county. Now in the state of California, we divide our state up by counties. Now within the county are cities. So if this piece of paper is the state of California, and then we have a county, then we have cities. I don't know if you can see that. So the paper is the state, the circle is the county, and the squares are the cities. Do you notice the space in between the city and yep. that space? The space in between the cities is the county. So okay. the county patrols the area in between the cities. Now, what's interesting is, is that the county sheriff can go into the city if he wants to, they can overlap. Mm. So if the sheriff wants to go into the city, the sheriff certainly can, yeah. but out of respect, because it's already being patrolled and paid for by the city residents, the sheriffs don't usually go into someone's city and police that city out of respect, out of courtesy, but they certainly can. And certainly the city can ask for help and the sheriff can go in and help them whenever they want. But the sheriff patrols the non-city area, the county. So there's a lot of county area. So the sheriff sets up their own stations in the major uh, county areas and they patrol, they're so busy patrolling their own county areas. They're pretty big. Mm -hmm. So they've got a lot to do. So they don't, they don't have to take time to patrol the cities. They've got their own busyness to do in the counties. But everyone helps out and everyone shares and everyone, uh, if anyone needs help, any neighboring city to a county, the police will help out the sheriff and the sheriff will help out the police. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for okay. clarifying the difference between sheriff and the police officer and the duties of the sheriff and the police. That's very nice. Uh, I mean, before going to the police, I mean, uh, for reforms and those things. So what, what are your views on the Black Lives Matter, which is uh, right now going on in the country all over? And so what are your views on the uh, Black Lives Matter moment in the US right now? Wow. Well, where to even begin? It's such a big, big topic. Where to begin? Um, oh dear. Well, of course, of course, of course, the George Floyd situation has, has caused the nation to once again look at this underlying um, situation, which has always been there, it, it, it's there. The, um, certainly all lives matter, all lives matter, but, but one cannot deny that, that by being black, there is certainly the, the image of prejudice that one cannot deny. At the same time, at the same time, there are so many great representatives in the black community that are out there trying to explain to the black community, look, Yes, there's always going to be prejudice out there amongst all cultures, cultures, amongst all races, that you first have to pick yourself up and you have to try as hard as you can individually to step beyond those prejudices and work your way up yourself so that you can fight against those prejudices. I mean, we have politicians, we have 
uh, professional entertainers, professional sports people. We have great scholars who are black, who are, who are uh, of all cultures. And, and they're incredibly intelligent, incredibly brilliant people. And, and they've been able to pick themselves up and move beyond that. And so one cannot say that, that every black person is, is, is you know, um, is, is, I, I think every, every society and every community has a bad map also every, and not everybody from that community is evil or bad. And is, is that what you're trying to say? Exactly. And, and, and I think that obviously where we need to take this, you know, is to, is to recognize that, that can we overcome this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Can we rise above this? Absolutely. And, and we cannot let George Floyd's death, you know, we can't, we have to use this as a direction for the country to go and rise above it and, and, and use it to help us understand that we can never go back again. That We have to use this as a motivation to help us all recognize that all lives do indeed matter and that, that we have to, we do have to rise above this. Got it. Thank you very much. See, I mean, I know we have you're you being a police officer. I mean, a police officer, a sheriff. I mean, uh, and you you have the responsibility of uh, keeping the community safe and uh, uh, making the uh, city, the county safe. Yeah, and we have known many stories about the police officers helping many uh, people, or children, or even the women and the oldest people. I mean, any situation you have seen on the national TV, local TV. I mean, the, uh, no doubt there are very good, very good people. But do you, as being a first time officer, uh, do you see any kind of uh, this kind of narrative? Like, I mean, uh, police officers are biased or have an opinion, I mean, uh, on this specific uh, groups. So, do you uh, ever say those kind of things when you were working as a police officer? I'm terribly sorry. You were breaking up. Um, and oh. It was. Could you just repeat shortly the question itself? Sure, sure. I mean, I mean, as being a police officer, I mean, have you uh, ever uh, seen this kind of uh, biased opinions on specific groups? All right. <laughs> I was. I was. I guess I've been waiting for that question from quite a few commentators because obviously everybody knows that I, I'm a past sheriff and I've been waiting for that question. So yeah. uh, here is my answer to it. <sighs> Regrettably, there is a brotherhood amongst police officers and regrettably, um, yes, that unexplainable action is out there in the nation. And it's regrettably taught from the very beginning. The moment those young officers are brought into the academy, they're taught with this quasi-military kind of atmosphere of, you know, pull out your gun, uh, you know, uh, approach the suspect, give orders and the whole bit. Well, from there, you're given a training officer and you're to follow that training officer's directions. You're not to question that training officer and you're to follow his directions, obviously. And if you don't, you're casted out and, uh, Pretty much, if, if you aren't part of the team, then you can't be trusted amongst the officers. And so you're, you, either, you either fall in line or you're outcasted. 
And hopefully you, you don't get into anything truly severe, but as you can see, those other officers on the George Floyd situation, they just stood by and watched something as horrendous as that particular action. I mean, on a scale of one to 10, that was an 11. And that was truly severe. And yet the public watched as these other officers stood by and did nothing. I mean, to the general public, that's unexplainable. It, it, it caused the general public to ask why, why didn't these other officers jump in and stop this? Because the lead officer was in control and you don't question the lead officer. You, you, don't, you don't do that. And you must understand that throughout the entire country, that's how we as officers are brought up to learn what to do. It's across the country. It's in every police station. It's everywhere across the country. Now, does that mean we have to technically start over and literally fire every police officer in the country tomorrow and, and literally rehire new people with a new way of thinking? Well, <laughs> although technically the answer to that is yes, but as you logically know, that's impossible. And by the way, we do need trained officers who do know how to combat um, uh, uh, dangerous uh, criminals who are out there every day with guns and who are robbing at, at, at gunpoint. I mean, I just replayed a, a a 1964, 1970 gun battle in Los Angeles in the Bank of America. It was a 45 minute gun battle. It was in the 1970s. And it's on, it's on the videos. If you look back for Los Angeles, 1970 Bank of America gun battle, you'll see a, a replay of that 45 minute gun battle. And by the way, that happened simply because a Los Angeles police officer happened to be driving by a Bank of America as the robbers were going into the bank with mm. bulletproof vests on. It was by accident that the officers happened to see this or else the robbers would have probably gotten away. But the officers were able to surround the bank before the robbers got out. And then the gun battle took place for 45 minutes. Now, we need experienced officers trained in those types of situations. But at the same time, we don't need officers arresting regular citizens for simple infractions. We don't need that. We need peace officers, not police officers gotcha thank you very much for your views on this i mean I, you mentioned that i mean in the police department you are uh, you uh, you have to follow the leader i i got we got the point i mean sometimes leaders can uh, emotionally or uh, decision wise it can go in the other direction but in general do you see a bias and in a different group is my voice clear or still Oh dear, I'm sorry. You're breaking up again. I'm sorry. What was the? I don't know what's the problem with my voice. Uh, yeah, my question is, I'm repeating the same question. I know. I mean, you have said you said that. I mean, you have to follow the leader or the lead police officer, but does the police department still have any bias on different groups? Yeah, in general, as a, as a general police officer, I don't want to let us say a new uh, officer comes in. I mean, do you see any bias in the uh, in his mind about different groups? Oh dear, um, I'm, I'm so not, sorry. I'm not. I'm not understanding the question. Oh, okay. Is my voice not clear? So let me do. Yes, one. it's breaking. It's breaking up. I'm only getting like every third word. So, 
sorry but let me try one more time and do you see a bias in the police officer's mind about different groups do i see bias in the officer's mind about different groups yeah any of uh, in general uh a new officers yeah new officer or any officer in general well, if I'm answering the if I'm if I'm answering the question correctly, um, I certainly believe that every new officer who comes into wanting to be a police officer, I truly believe their heart is in the right place. I absolutely believe that. I, I believe that they want to do good for the public. I I, I don't believe that they want to do any harm uh, in any way. Unfortunately, up until now, they've just been taught the wrong way up to now, and, and they've just been misdirected. I think that with what has been exposed, they're now aware of it, and, and I'm hoping that there'll be an entirely new perspective on teaching these new officers on how to address um, all these different types of situations in an entirely different way with an entirely different approach. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now coming to the point, I mean, another point, like, I mean, now the moment is uh, to defund the police department and uh, more than that, I mean, uh, repealing the qualified immunity. Well, certainly, again, everyone is talking about defunding police, which of course, I, I like to hope that everyone understands that, that what that really simply means is shifting the money to other branches of the police department so that the money is spent on other services that are linked to the police department, such as a mental response team that deals with mental illness or uh, uh, marital uh, response teams to deal with mentally uh, uh, marital problems, uh, children's support services, um, all types of things like that. So since every police department runs on a budget, of course, there's only so much money that can go around. So yes, you're going to have to take some money from the actual policing and shift it over and divide it up so that you get these broader services. So for that, I support that 100%. Um, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that is fine. I mean, I got the point. And the qualified immunity, I mean, what do you think about the uh, repealing the qualified immunity to the police officers? Qualified immunity. If you're referring to whether or not officers should um, be immune from prosecution? Yes. Is that what you mean? Okay. Yes. Uh, well, absolutely not. No, 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 no. Uh, certainly. Uh, no, uh, there's two issues there. Number one, what has obviously caused this problem of police brutality is the fact that the, this has grown because of the overwhelming power that police officers have grown to accept about what their badge represents and what they're allowed to do. Their power has grown to an endless array of not being questioned or not having to worry about prosecution and, and, and which has allowed them to do all of this. So, so by all means, that has to be taken away. Now, certainly, certainly they have to be allowed to do their job, but their job has to be contained within the parameters of their duty and what they're limited to do. If they go beyond those limitations, 
They have to understand that they can be prosecuted. No different than a lawyer. If a lawyer breaks his duties, um, a lawyer can be sued. That's what malpractice is. Now we carry malpractice insurance, but if we if we do something that goes beyond the insurance coverage, then we can be sued personally. No different than a doctor. If a doctor stays, what? How are we doing yep. here? There we go. If a doctor if a doctor stays within his boundaries, his insurance will cover him. But if he goes beyond, if he drinks, let's say he drinks before surgery, you can't drink before surgery. You can't do that. So, no, I don't think officers should be immune at, at all. Gotcha. That's fair enough. I mean, your points. I mean, now coming back to your core uh, other uh, topics, like, I mean, homelessness, and you said you have a solution for the homelessness in the. And California is one of the you know, states, I mean, where you have more maximum homeless people. So what is the core problem or issue? Are you able to hear me properly or not? Let me, uh, let me, I want to. Gotcha. Okay. okay. I need to plug in my power here. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Uh, All right. My question is, I mean, you know, homelessness, I mean, you said you have solutions. So what is the core problem or core issue? Why many people are becoming homeless uh, people in the US and, and especially in LA and San Francisco? Well, uh, that is a rather long subject. I, I, I'm gonna try and keep it brief and I'm hoping I get re-invited again to talk about this okay. subject. Uh, if we have much more time, uh, obviously it's my favorite subject and I, I'm obviously hoping to solve it. Uh, but in, 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 as, in as short of a time period as I can explain, it starts really, uh, well, one of the many starting points is, uh, Ronald Reagan is one of my favorite presidents and he's done many great things. One of the m mistakes uh, that he made, um, uh, and, and it was a, it was a, um, it was an error that, that oh, he made it, but he thought he was doing a good thing at the time that he made it. And he released, he shut down all the mental institutions across the country, thinking that he was saving money, thinking that the states would take over the care of the mentally ill. And in so doing, all these mentally ill people were brought back into society. But as it turned out, none of the states picked up on the care of the mentally ill and the mentally ill ended up on the streets. That in combination with our current inability to care for our alcohol, uh, th those that are on drug dependency and alcohol dependency. Uh, and then of course, those that are, are truly homeless because they don't have the ability to, or, or the mental capability of working or, and then we have those that are illegally, uh, illegal immigrants that don't have the job capabilities. This whole entire combination in, in uh, cooperation with the fact that you're gonna have states like California because of our weather, of course, they're gonna come here. And if you're gonna live outside, at least you wanna live outside where it's not gonna be cold. So we have, that's why we have the large number of homeless that we do, especially here in California. So, so but the real question is, how do we solve it? How, how do we solve this problem? Well, um, President Trump, in, in the beginning of his, of his um, term, right away, he basically said, look, I'm sorry, it's the problem of the states. The states have to solve this problem on their own. Um, you know, we'll give them some support, but it's not a national problem, it's a state problem. Well, with all due respect to our commander in chief, uh, I, I respectfully disagree. This is indeed a national problem where everyone in the country must take responsibility for our homeless. So we must, as a nation, recognize that responsibility and we have to come together with one entirely broad understanding of the entire picture, which means we have to recognize that at the top of the list is the mentally ill, is the alcohol dependency, is the drug dependency, those that are suffering from that. 
and, and all these different branches that make up a homeless person. So we need to identify those various branches. Now, once we identify those various branches, we need to identify what it takes to solve those different branches. Well, for the mentally ill, we need mental care. Same thing for alcoholism, same thing for drug dependency and, and, and a branch from that. Then you need to identify, well, who's gonna do that? You need doctors, you need caretakers, you need psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, and then who do you need beyond that? You need the support teams, you need janitors, you need facilities, you need, you, you need uh, cafeteria workers, you need a whole community of people to care for these people. So what does that mean? Here's what it means. There are areas in every state that are currently not being used. In every state across the United States, there are vast areas that are just not being used. I was running in the 25th Congressional District. We have what's called the Antelope Valley, Lancaster, Palmdale. In those areas, we have some very vast unused areas in our district that are not being used. What if the nation was to get behind those areas right now and build, here we go, I hope you're sitting down, here we go. What if we were to build a community, and I'm talking about a massive size community for the purpose of solving homelessness. Now, what I mean by that is, we just identified all these different branches of homelessness, but wait, I happen to mention doctors and nurses and support personnel. Those people need somewhere to service these people. That means these doctors and nurses and support teams they need homes to live in so they can travel five, 10, 15 minutes away to their job. So these people need homes and parks and shopping centers and movie theaters and restaurants and a community and schools. And we need a university to teach these nurses how to care for the mentally ill and so forth and so on and so on and so on. I'm talking about building a massive community, massive, with beautiful homes, not cheap homes. I'm talking about building beautiful, beautiful, beautiful communities that doctors want to live in that nurses and their families want to live in, but 10, 15, 20 minutes away is their job where we have built hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homes and, and places for the homeless to live and to put these people in their own communities to temporarily live to reacclimate them and then go back to the individual cities. Remember those cities that I mentioned throughout the state of California that have been working for the last 10, 20 years on trying to address the homeless problem where these individual cities have built maybe five houses, maybe three houses, maybe 10 houses in the city of Laguna, in the city of San Marino, in the city of Pasadena, they have a few houses. We, we basically, once these homeless graduate from our community, we can start spreading them back out into the individual communities throughout the state, throughout the country, where, whereas the smaller communities 
have already built these homes and we graduate them to those next housing levels. And from those housing levels, these homeless graduate into their own, making those community homes available for the next graduate. Do you follow what I'm saying? I got you, but I mean, who's going to pay the bill here? All right, that always becomes the next question. All right, who pays for this? All right, let's get to that because that's really important, okay? Because who's gonna pay the bill? There are two ways to pay for this, actually three. There are three ways to pay for this. Now, I could give you the short version. All right, let me give you the short version first, okay? Let's just say it's already been paid for, okay? Okay, now I know you're over there in India, right? You're in India? I'm in Michigan right now. Okay, all right. If I told you that it's all been paid for and the, and the American public doesn't have to worry about a penny, um, would you then be supportive of it and say, and raise your hand and cheer and say, go for it? Yeah, if it's already paid for and accounted for, yes. I mean, yeah, then it's not costing extra, probably. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's start with that one. Number one, already paid for. Great. Go for it. All right. I love hearing that. In truth, technically, that's the answer. That's the short version. And, and technically, that's, that's great. Well, that's another invite back to talk to you about where the money comes from and the whole bit. But I'll leave you with this wonderful thought on that issue. And you might want to write this down. Here we go. It's uh, look up this term after we get off the air. Uh, and this is for your listeners to educate them. Look up the word fiat, F-I-A-T, F-I-A-T, fiat, like the car. But it's not a car that I'm talking about. You do, in the, in the United States, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, our, our economy was based on a security element called um, the gold standard. Remember, we all grew up with the gold standard, right? I think you did too, right? Do you know what our standard is now? I don't, I don't want to say it. Please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. Well, I'll tell you what. You look up that word after we get off the air and you'll have fun with that word, okay? All right, that's number one. How we're going to pay for this. Number two. Number two. All right. All right. We have... The internet. The internet is something that wasn't created when I was growing up. Uh, I, I was a kid in the 50s and uh, pretty much I played baseball out in the street and ran around and did everything in the whole bit. There wasn't anything called the internet. Uh, there wasn't anything like this. And somewhere, I don't know, the 70s, the 80s, who? I'd have to even look it up when the internet was built and when all this uh, technology came to be. And now, of course, we have cell phones and we can't live our day without jumping on the internet every single day. Right? Okay. Well, um, somebody's making money on the internet, aren't they? Right? Okay. Well, you've got the United States. I'm a terrible artist. Hold on. The only thing that makes me look like the United States is thank God is Florida. Gotcha. I think that little that little sign makes it look like Florida. Okay, so there's the United States. Okay, here we go. The internet technically um, is us. I mean, we, the people of the United States, we, we kind of run the internet. I mean, we're the customers of the internet. Um, without us, really, nobody's making any money. Uh, the internet needs us, right? Mm -hmm. Makes pretty much good sense. I mean, well, without people, I mean, business without people, it's nothing. Right, yeah. right. Well, somebody's making money on the internet. Somebody is. And, or let's, uh, let's just say a lot of people are. 
But the average person really isn't making any money on the internet, the average person. Uh, but some te technological people certainly are. And some of these brilliant people who know how to do it certainly are. Um, and the internet is around the world. So other people in other parts of the world are making tons of money on the internet. However, however, the United States, that's our country and India is their country and Japan is their country. Well, we have borders, Japan has borders, India has borders. Well, the borders can actually, as you know, you have to cross over to get into our country. Um, you gotta kind of step over the line, step over the border. How high does that border go up? Well, if there was an invisible wall, it could go up into space, okay? Well, if that internet uh, beam or whatever you call it, has to cross over our border, someone's got to pay a fee. Now, if that money is small, it's just a token. But if it means helping our country and those small fees are there to assist our country in aiding our country to help our homeless and other social benefits, only for the benefit of social benefiting our country. Would you give a few pennies for that? Probably. And probably, mm -hmm. probably. And would I give a few pennies to help the people in India? If I had to use the internet to go over to India, I sure would. I would do it the for Japan. Our business environment is a little different, so we uh, probably right. let us. Yeah, the business is different, and the charity is different, and that we need to see how it works. That's a good idea. Right. Right. Continue, right. That's Dave. That's David Lozano's idea. No one I've watched and monitored, and no one has come up with that idea yet. That's David Lozano's idea, and that's Very for nice. the benefit of that's for the benefit of the world because everybody is welcome to use my idea. And they're welcome to, to use it for their social benefiting. Perfect. That's no idea. That's idea God, number two. That's idea number two. Okay. I said there were three. Okay. Want me to keep going? Go ahead. Go ahead. Please go. Let, let's conclude this one of the three, and then we can come back. Certainly, we'll come back with, uh, for more details from you in another show for sure. I mean, you have a lot of points to discuss for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lawyer and a politician. I mean, what do you, what do you, we could talk yeah. forever. I agree. You know? I totally agree. I mean, we will, yeah, let's conclude this one and then we can go back to the, come back another day for sure. And, and we can talk about it uh, in detail in other topics. Too, so. Okay, let's see here. Um, okay. Uh, I have all my notes here now. Here, what am I? Well, you were talking about the third point for the uh, funding of our homelessness idea. I mean, you said about the second point of charging the internet charges, and you were saying about the third point, right? Right, right. Oh dear, I'm blanking out here a minute. I got so excited about the second point, trying to trying to to uh, describe that here. I got thrown off by my drawing here on Florida, um, uh, and teaching the fiat here. Um, yeah. Oh dear. Um, oh, oh. Um, the other point, the other way is this. Um, the, everybody always seems to want to rely on taxing. That seems to be always the, the, um, the politicians um, source of income that everybody talks about taxing and it always ends up falling on the common man to have to pay the higher tax okay um, let's throw that out the window that's never going to work people hate that word and it always as I just said it always falls upon the common man so throw that out completely in fact 
the re the reality of the situation is it somewhat builds up a bitterness to the rich because people somewhat carry either a grudge or a bitterness towards the rich because the rich are rich and the rich seem to be getting richer and and that builds a further divide in our society because the the rich have so much and the poor have so little but what if and then even if the rich seem to make great wonderful donations that always seems to be a little bit short lived it seems as if the public has a slight short memory on the beautiful wonderful things that the rich do do actually do i mean in truth the, the there are some wonderfully beautiful rich people out there who do make some incredible donations and they do absolutely make beautiful contributions and regrettably i don't think they actually do get enough um uh, uh enough uh uh tax credits that are talking about right and 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 then somebody will always say oh they're just doing it for a tax uh relief or they're getting a tax break or whatever blah blah, blah. all right fair enough um we've heard all these things before however in this particular circumstance i'm trying to fund um the solution to homelessness and as i described something like this would cost billions of dollars not millions billions so how are we going to fund this all right as i described two ways here's the third what if we go to our millionaires our rich people and there are many by the way but let's go to our wealthy let's go to our wealthy people in our nation let's go to them and we say to them look we're not going to tax you okay however we are going to identify your wealth and according to your numbers you are extremely wealthy and you have whatever you want you have your home or homes you have your boats you have your cars you have whatever you want your jewelry your watches your you have whatever you want and you still have more money coming in here's what we're going to do we're not going to tax you but what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to take let's start out with and i'm just making this number up we're going to take 40% oh that sounds a little too high how about 30% well wait a minute that's too low how about 35% ah let's go back to 40 let's take 40% of your money cuz remember you're wealthy you've got so much money coming in it doesn't matter because remember you got here already the reason why we're talking to you is because you are already wealthy you've already got everything so by me coming to you now and asking for 40% it's money you don't even need you're already wealthy so let's go with 40% All right. What we're going to do is we're going to take 40% of your money for the rest of your life. No wait. And we're going to put it in reserve. Do you remember Fort Knox? Do you? Oh yeah, Tennessee. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay, we're going to take that 40% from every wealthy person in the United States. and we're going to put it in fort knox okay mm-hmm. we're going to take that 40% and put it in fort knox and we're going to do it for your lifetime 
until you die. And then we're going to keep it there for three generations of your children and your children's children. Got it? Now, that money doesn't become the property of the United States until those three generations are exhausted. Got it? Okay. Okay. Now, remember, we're not taking all of it. Gotcha. We're not taking all of his money. Okay. The will that you just spoke of, that's going to his family however he wishes to do it. That's a different kind of money. Okay. We're only taking 40%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, during that time period, if anything were to happen to him and he was to run out of money during his lifetime, or his children were to run out of money during their lifetime of the three generations, um, they could go in and withdraw certain portions of that money. Now, remember, now um, this gets a little complicated, but during his life, the, there are sections that they can't draw from. So in other words, he puts in a certain amount. Once he dies, a certain amount cannot be touched again. The children can only draw from a certain amount. It, it's remember, I'm a lawyer, so I've already got this all drafted out. So it's not as easy as it sounds, but the point is, is that they still have access to his money, a sum of it. Do you get it? Yep, but in I the meantime, it. the country is drawing on the interest. Okay, and mm -hmm. we're using that money to fund social programs until it becomes our money. Gotcha. It's a good idea and good planning. I mean, but I mean, yes, I, uh, you, you are running on a good cause, but at the same time, but I don't think how many people will be, these homeless people will be voting for you. Uh, I mean, that's a challenge, different topic, but we can come back and talk to you on all those things another, uh, in another call. Thank you very much for your time and for input and for views, especially at the police department and also uh, the water trip. That was a very good experience. So, do you have any message, anything you want to say in the last minute? No, I'm honored to be speaking on your on your show here. I deeply appreciate it. No problem. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. David Lazano, and have a nice rest of the day and good luck with things with whatever you do. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Have a nice rest of the day. Thank you, sir. All right. Bye-bye.